a lot of what I talk about on this channel are topics that are easy for someone to listen to and then project onto someone else. Because a lot of times we don't wanna see what's wrong with the things that we do, but it's very easy to see it in someone else. What I want to do is cover a quote about spirituality and religion. And I think, for me at least, it was easy for me to take the quote and project it onto someone else and analyze someone else's spiritual practice or religious practice. And I really hope that that doesn't happen in this video for the people watching it. I know that's a lot easier said than done. I mean, I'm, a, I'm exhibit A here. Like, I couldn't even do that initially. But I think if I went into it consciously, knowing that it was going to be <laughs> easy to project onto someone else, I could have, you know, resisted a little bit. So that's what I'm trying to do is say, we're going to talk about a quote from James Hollis, who's a Jungian psychoanalyst about spiritual practices. And what I hope for the people watching this is that you can turn inward instead of projecting outward and focus on the, focus on your own spiritual practice and see if what he says here can help you better your own spiritual practice. Because for me, it really was eye-opening to some of the things that I have adopted and the things that I'm trying to do. So I'm gonna read the first section of the quote. Once again, this is from James Hollis. He says, it is of paramount importance that our spirituality be validated or confirmed by fidelity to our personal experience. A spiritual tradition that is only received from history or from family makes no real difference in a person's life, for he or she is living by conditioned, reflexive response. Only what is experientially true is worth a mature spirituality. So what he's kind of talking about here is, is, is the religion or spiritual practice that you are born into massively affects your spiritual practice for the duration of your life. I mean, a lot of religions will encourage you to, you know, know for yourself, to seek uh, uh, some sort of conviction on your own. And that's great, and I think that, that that's kind of what he's talking about when he says that we need to find what is experientially true for ourselves. But in this exploration to get this experiential understanding of spiritual practice, uh, it seems almost useless because, I mean, think just anecdotally in your life. How many people do you know that grew up around you that went out and, you know, experimented with spiritual practices and went from Christian to dropping everything and to become Muslim? Or vice versa, how many people in India do you think that are Hindu all of a sudden drop everything and become a uh, Jehovah's Witness. Like, it's incredibly rare. And so even if you are able to go out and experiment and, and figure out what is true subjectively for you, what are the chances that you'll do a 180? What are the chances that you, because I mean, you see people leave Christianity and become atheists, but that's just kind of two sides of the same coin. When do you see someone change spiritual practices from one religion to another religion. Especially when it, it go, it's not just another sect of Christianity or something like that. I don't know, that's just something I think about. And so I guess my question that I've been thinking about with this section of the quote is, is tradition worth keeping at all? Or is tradition worth keeping because it's just tradition and, and you don't question that? Like, where do you draw the line with tradition? And does that mean that we need to explore all religions exhaustively to the point where we know as much as there is to know about each religion? And where do you draw the line there? And, and even in that exploration, can you, is it possible to be unbiased? Is it possible to leave behind your culture, your religion, the, the religion of your parents that was ingrained in you from the beginning? Like, I wonder how much of my personal journey is due to the fact that my parents 
and the, the people around me all studied a, a version of Christianity. And that's what they all believed in. And, and so even as I have deconstructed my religion, the teachings of Jesus, the Christian teachings still, they just, they hit different in a good way. And so like, I know that that is my internal bias because I, I, someone that has worshiped Allah their whole life, their, the teachings of Jesus are not gonna ring as true as the teachings that they heard growing up. But as far as my personal journey, I've taken two words from one of my favorite authors, Richard Rohr, transcend and include. And I think that has really helped me bring the pearls with me as I walk down this path. Hollis continues his quote, so often spirituality like the false self is fear driven, which is not to be judged, but a fear driven spirituality will always diminish rather than enlarge. It has been said that religion is for those who are afraid to go to hell and spirituality is for those who have been there. So what I think Hollis is getting at here is just the fact that fear is often unfortunately used in spiritual practices. And when it does that, it diminishes, it shrinks, it compacts, it, 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 it brings a sense of scarcity and a sense of persecution and victimhood. Over this last weekend, I watched a movie with my kids called Smallfoot. And in that movie, one of the characters says a quote that stuck out and it said, the only thing more powerful than fear is curiosity. And I don't feel like I preach a ton on this, on these videos that I do, but at least I, at least I hope it doesn't feel like that. But if you've watched any of my videos, you know how I feel about curiosity. I think that if you're going to be one thing in this life, be curious. And I think it's because curiosity truly does, instead of closing and collapsing and bringing a sense of scarcity and fear and us versus them, kind of division, curiosity brings a sense of openness, a sense of unity, a sense of possibility and progress and growth. And, and I think curiosity can remove the doom and gloom that some strict dogmatic religious teachings can have. So I guess the questions that I've been grappling with after this section of the quote is, how do my spiritual practices, because this, this can look like and can feel like an attack on religion, but spirit, almost all spiritual practices, when used incorrectly, when abused, can have this element of fear. And I think it takes true introspection, true critical thought to see that, you know, even things down to astrology, that can be fear-based, it can be tarot cards. And so I guess this is my question. What does your spiritual practice do that can involve fear in any way? Is there, is there fear, is there action that you take from your spiritual practice that is driven out of fear? And how is fear used, even minimally, but is it present at all in your spiritual practice? Because I, I do agree with Hollis when he says that fear diminishes when it comes to spirituality. The next section of the quote from Hollis says, any spiritual perspective that seeks to finesse difficult questions of good and evil, that seeks to scapegoat others or defers authority to external sources is an infantilizing spirituality. Any spirituality that makes people feel guilty and judged is merely adding to the complexes that they already have. Any spirituality that keeps people in bondage to fear, to tradition, to anything other than which is validated by their personal experience is doing violence to the soul. If your spiritual practice is pointing you outward to solve problems, then it is infantilizing. So if the problem to be solved is anyone besides yourself, if, it, if the problem is your spouse, if the problem is your neighbor, if the problem is the other people, if the problems are the, are the, are the liberals or the conservatives or the Muslims or the world or the atheists or the secular people, whatever it is, if your spiritual practice is pointing you outward instead of inward to fix your problems, then your spiritual practice is not 
promoting progress or growth, it is stunting your growth. At least that's what he's saying, and I, I tend to agree. Where is your spiritual practice pointing you? Is it pointing you outwards or inwards? And do you feel like your spiritual practice tells you that you're being persecuted for your beliefs? And if so, does that sense of persecution help enhance your spiritual practice or does it detract from your spiritual practice? Last, but certainly not least, Hollis finishes the quote by saying, By these criteria, many, if not most, spiritual practices are affronts to the larger life to which we are summoned. It's helpful for me to, to imagine or believe that there is a higher self and a lower self within all of us. And the higher self calls us to live a higher law, to live a better, more inclusive, more loving life. And the lower self is powered by fear and avoids responsibility. It avoids introspection and it always places blame and plays victim. And I, I feel like if we could do in a quick introspection on our spiritual practice and on all spiritual practices and, and realize that there are things that we do that think that, that we think are enhancing, but they're actually detracting from our spiritual progression. And I think if we did that, it would result in a lot less division, a lot more inclusivity, a lot more unity, and a lot more understanding and compassion. And I don't want anyone to mistake this as an attack on religion. I mean that this is, on, this is something that we can all do for all kinds of spirituality. We can do an audit at any time on our spiritual practices. And I think that we need to do that more often. And so what I want to do is just leave you with kind of one final all-encompassing question that you can take to yourself. And the question is, what in your life, spiritual practice or not, is keeping you from heeding the call of your higher self? Anyways, I hope this quote was eye-opening to you. And even if you don't think that he's right, I hope that some of the questions that it spurred for me were introspective enough for you to take a critical look at your life. But anyways, I hope you like this video and I'll catch you in the next one.